All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Madeline Wood. Thanks for joining us virtually. We like to do uh, these as workshops and actually hands-on workshops. Kathy has been teaching a drip irrigation hands-on workshop for many years now. Um, so we're doing what we can in the virtual format. We have uh, some presentation slides and then Kathy will be doing a show and tell portion as well because um, it's really ha handy to see the tools and see the uh, devices that we're talking about. So you may be familiar with Zoom meetings. This is a Zoom webinar, which functions a little bit differently in that everyone else is muted and everyone else has their cameras off. So the only people you'll be hearing and seeing are Kathy and myself. Uh, so feel free to enjoy your lunch. We can't hear you or see you. Um, and as we go through the slides, it's about um, a 40 minute presentation and we're planning to do the question and answer at the end. But you can ask questions in the Q&A feature throughout the presentation. You don't have to wait until the end. So you should see that Q&A sort of chat bubbles on your Zoom panel, and that's where you can type in the questions at any time. We are recording this, this presentation and I'll be posting it on our web page as well as emailing it out to everyone that registered for the class. And that will be either the end of this week or early next week. So you'll be able to get the recording to refer to. Um, we're also going to have some polling questions, and those are um, a fun way to just get some information and, and report back. And we'll start with a practice poll that I'll launch right now. And the question is, did you see the Christmas star on December 21st? The answers are yes, no, and what is the Christmas star? <laughs> I was one of those who completely missed it. So, <laughs> um, all right, the poll, the polls are coming in. I'll give everyone another um, half a minute or so to answer. Looks like we've got some astronomers on our hands because uh, we are getting a lot of yeses. All right, perfect. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. So we've got more than half had seen it, about a quarter hadn't, and uh, several are not sure what the Christmas star is. Um, Kathy, do you mind illuminating what the Christmas star is? The Christmas star, if you missed it, you will get a chance to see it again. It'll be back in 800 years. So <laughs> put it on your calendar. But the Christmas star is actually a, um, a convergence of Jupiter and Saturn. They lined up together. And so what we saw was an exceptionally bright star right as the sun was going down. I thought it was really interesting that it actually came up on um, summer, on winter solstice as well. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. Um, so we'll have a few more polls. Uh, that was just a practice one. And now I want to introduce our instructor for today, Kathy Perret. Some of you may have had the pleasure of getting her irrigation assistance either at your home or business in the past with our free irrigation evaluation program. Uh, during COVID, we're not doing home visits, but we are available to help virtually either through an app, a virtual app, or over the phone for irrigation questions or assistance that you may have. Um, so Kathy is a water resources specialist with the city. She's a certified irrigation auditor, and she's also an avid home gardener and beekeeper. And Kathy, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thanks, Madeline. I appreciate that. Well, today we're going to really try and focus on efficient uh, irrigation, aka drip irrigation. People either hate it or they love it. Um, I am one of those that loves it, and I think that one of the reasons is is that it's something that every single person can do. You don't have to hire someone. You can do it hands-on. You don't have to be exceptionally handy, as long as you don't mind uh, playing in the garden a little bit. So let's go to the next slide here. And we're going to cover a, a bunch of stuff today. I'm going to do it pretty quick, but uh, so you'll be able to read some things that are on the slides. I'm not going to read them to you. If any of you have taken classes with me before, 
you know that I am much more of a hands-on and a part audience participation teacher. So bear with me today. I'm pretending that you're all right here in front of me and, and we're gonna play with the parts. But we're gonna cover a little bit of, of why you would choose to use drip in your landscape. And if you have it, um, how can you keep it working efficiently and um, keep your plants happy and healthy? We're gonna talk a little bit about how a drip system actually works from the water supply out to the emitters. If you don't understand it, you can't fix it. So we'll look at the parts. We're gonna go over a little bit of the guidelines. How can you get the most from what you currently have and how to make it a little bit more efficient. We're obviously gonna talk about problems because irrigation always has problems. And um, that's when we'll use our hands-on and we'll learn how to do some remedies and, and different repair fix-its that make it easier. And then for those of you that have drip at your house already, your plants are maturing. What do you do to take that system that you had and make it so that now it's working as efficiently for your new landscape or even the new planted areas? Next slide. The main reason why we want to use drip and efficient irrigation is it's pretty obvious. More than 50% of our water is used in the landscape. Next slide. And if you look at the different types of landscapes that there are, you can drive all around Santa Barbara. You'll see the traditional landscapes with the lawns and the nicely manicured hedges. And then right next door, you'll see sustainable landscapes with more um, water-wise features, rain catchment features, plants that use a third of the amount of water. And they are much more re resource efficient, less water, less yard waste, and a whole lot less manpower. That saves you time and money in the long run. And they're beautiful. Next slide. So drip irrigation, the number one reason is that it's phenomenally efficient. It applies water directly to the root zones of the plants. You're not spraying it in the air. You're not getting aerosolized. It's not blowing away. It's not running off. Um, think about what kind of soil you have at your home. Most of us in Santa Barbara and Goleta, we have a lovely layer of clay. Clay does not absorb water very fast. So drip irrigation will apply the water in a steady, slow, controlled manner, and it allows that water to saturate into the soil, to go down to the base of the roots, and also to absorb horizontally out into the feeder roots or the absorptive roots of the plants. Drip irrigation is, it's applied in gallons per hour. Each little emitter, you can choose a half a gallon, one gallon, or two gallon per hour emitter versus traditional conventional pop-up sprays, uh, those are running at just about two gallons per minute per spray head. So we're applying a really slow, efficient manner of water to the soil for the plants. Drip irrigation is kind of a no dig thing. It's on the surface. You can actually, if you add some new plants, you can add a new tubing. If you lose a few plants, uh, you can put goof lugs and now you're not watering the dirt anymore. Next slide. So a little quick question here. We're gonna run a poll question so that I can direct my, um, my conversation a little more. Uh, what time of, type of irrigation do you currently have? Do you have drip at your house? Do you have pop-up sprinklers? Do you have a combination of both of them? Or do you water just with a hose and a watering can? We'll take just a kind of a minute here for everybody to, to fill those out. And Madeline, when you get most of the answers, can you close the poll? Yep, let me just give people a couple more oh, seconds. Okay. Thank you. All righty, here we go. Ah, okay. So it looks like half, at least almost half the folks have uh, drip irrigation. And it looks like the same 12 folks have a combination of both. And then we have people that 
water part of their landscape by hand and are using pop-ups. So this is great. Thank you. So this is gonna be a worthwhile class, especially for those of you that currently have drip irrigation. You'll be able to uh, do a little bit of the self-maintenance on your own. So a quick visual here. Drip irrigation the, has a variety of different parts of it. Basically, it has a water supply. It can be a hose or a valve. It has a backflow preventer, uh, which in case you get a break in your water pipe, it's going to protect your drinking water supply uh, from actually getting dirt back in it. It's going to have a pressure regulator because drip needs to have really low pressure in order to drip and not to stream. We're going to filter water because there might be some sediment and those drip emitters are really tiny and they clog up with grit and ants and believe it or not, slugs. Ack. I'm sorry, I don't like slugs, but they get in the ends of the drip emitters. And then you have your drip tubing. Next slide, please. So basically our water supply can be either of these. Um, on these pictures, on the left-hand side, you'll see that funky little screwed on place. That's a backflow preventer for a hose bib. And then if you actually have irrigation valves, those are anti-siphon valves. Uh, what those, when you turn them on, as soon as you turn it off, you're going to get a whoop of water that's going to come out of the zone. And then that valve is going to have an air pocket in it. So that's going to be your backflow preventer. Next slide. Pressure regulation. Most drip irrigation, you will have a filter pressure regulating assembly. So you don't have to put all these parts together. If you look at that middle picture in here, you're going to see the big bell-shaped filter. And um, that allows any debris that's it coming in from the water supply to be filtered out. And then the very next thing, that white and black piece, this one says 10 PSI. Drip systems can work up to 25 PSI. You'll most commonly see them at 20 to 25, but it's built into that assembly. This one, you can actually see it says 10. And the picture on the right hand side has a built in pressure regulator on it. So you, you won't see what that is, but you can buy the part already pre assembled and ready to attach. Next slide. So I'm going to do a quick, this is a pop quiz in your brain. I'll be Jeopardy host. Uh, what is, you've got to try and remember the numbers, what is the water pressure at the street? Give you about five seconds. Do you know what it is? And Madeline, what is the water pressure? 100 PSI. If you have a hose that's connected directly to your main line up front, you turn it on, it's like a fire hose. It blasts. So then obviously you don't want a full 100 PSI going into your house or into your irrigation. You have a pressure regulator that's on your house. What do you think the water pressure at your house should be? Drum roll, Madeline, 60. That's actually plumbing code, says that the pressure needs to be between 60 and 80 PSI. If you're finding that you're getting faucets that are leaking all the time, dripping and things that are happening regularly, check the water pressure in your house. You could just um, be in need of adjusting it back down to the 60 PSI. And then the most important, especially for this class, what would be the recommended pressure for drip irrigation? I think we all know the answer. And Madeline, 25, that's your maximum pressure. If you have more than 25 PSI, what you'll see is when the irrigation's running, you'll have a stream of water versus drips of water. And this needs to be applied in drips of water. That's one thing to look at when you're actually uh, doing a site evaluation and looking at your property. Next slide, please. So the main part of a drip system is basically the drip tubing and the emitters. So when you're looking at your garden, you're gonna see a main drip tube with these little teeny emitters. Let's go to the next slide and we'll break it down. So drip tubing can be solid. And with that solid tube, you'll need to punch a hole and attach the emitter into the tube or into, uh, they call it a spaghetti tube. It's a quarter of an inch little line that you can then put your, your emitter on to go directly to the plant. 
I put this up here because you can see that it has the blue stripe on it. If you have drip tubing with a green stripe, you'll need to buy connectors when you're making repairs that fit green stripes. The green stripe is a little smaller diameter and the normal fittings won't fit on it. That's just kind of out there, but I give you that hint real quick. Let's move to the next slide. Another type of drip tubing is inline emitter tubing. This has been around in agricultural irrigation for a long time. It's great for row crops. It's great for hedges. I really like it to put around the drip line of trees because it has built-in emitters at every 12 or 18 inches. So you know you're getting one gallon per hour at every one of those. And you can cover this, you can cover this tubing with mulch. You don't want to bury it, but you can cover it with mulch. And if you have foot traffic or pets that run on that, um, they won't be breaking off the, the little emitter tubings and things. So you won't have as much maintenance to do. Next slide, please. These are some different varieties of connectors. So when you have your big tubing, if you wanna take it and put it around a corner of your house, you would use an elbow connector. If you have a cut in a pipe or you wanna to attach two pieces to extend your irrigation, you would use a straight tube. And on these, if you go all the way down to the bottom and over to the right, you'll see that that's a connector you can connect onto a drip tube and it has a hose bib fitting. So if you're gonna water just straight off of a hose, you can screw it directly into this. And then if you look above, you'll see that there's green interior and blue interior connectors. And those are the two different ones for the different size tubes. And if you really wanna build your own connector, you can use PVC quarter inch connectors with an insert and you still have to glue it in. Not my first choice, but in case of emergency, uh, you can take care of that. Next slide. Obviously, you guys are all here. I would assume that you don't mind getting dirty, but are you a do-it-yourself kind of person? And have you uh, done any of it with the irrigation? Drip irrigation is one of those great things that even if you're not super comfortable, you can, you can actually figure it out if you understand the parts and the parts aren't terribly expensive either. All right, a couple more minutes for that question there. All right. Oh, yay. All right, if you're not afraid to get your hands dirty, you can maintain and uh, make sure that your drip is working well. You may not wanna do the initial installation, but once it's in and on the ground, it's not a problem. So I'm, gl I'm glad, this is good. All righty. Um, I put this one in because most people, when they're putting in their drip systems or they're moving pipes around to their new plants, they forget to stake the little black tube down. Um, those silly tubes move. Every time they get full of water, they snake and they move and then you wonder why you come out and your drip tube is on top of your plant. So you can uh, just grab a bag of these little stakes, tack them down, and you will be much, much happier uh, with you. And you won't feel like you've got uh, neighborhood kids coming and moving your pipes at night. So next slide, please. The connector, this is gonna be your friend. Everything, every time you get a cut, every time you get a gopher that chews on this or a shovel that hits your pipe, you're going to need to fix the hole. And the way to, to fix the hole in a drip tube is you use your pruning shears, you wanna cut out the chewed area or the, the shovel cut area and have a nice square cut separate those two pieces, get two clean edges, use a connector. I'll show you how to use it in person in a little bit, but you're actually gonna take the tube, put it up against the inside of the connector, and it takes a little bit of pressure and you wiggle it back and forth until that tube is inserted in. Don't stick your finger in the connector, there are little barbs in there. And if you ever grew up with those uh, 
one of the Chinese finger games where you put your finger in and the more you pull, the more it gets stuck. People have done that. So um, don't do it, you, but you can stick them together. Next slide, please. These are the only tools that you'd need to do a project all the way from the installation to just the simple repairs. You need a set of pruning shears. The green uh, tool on the left-hand side and the handle tool, those are for making hole punches in the tube so that you can connect your emitters in your spaghetti tube. Always when you're working with plumbing, if you have threaded areas, you're gonna wanna put plumbing tape on it. Uh, the, the little green tool next to it, it's for making holes, but I don't really like it for making holes very much. It's really difficult to do, but and I'll, I'll show you when we have the show and tell. It has a, a little hexagonal tool in the very end of it that's great for micro spray. And to save your fingertips, you're going to want a small set of pliers to hold on to goof plugs and emitters when placing them or removing them from a tube. So next slide, please. Either of these two tools work really well for making holes. The one thing to remember when you're wanting to install your emitters, when you're making a hole, that's the direction the emitter is going to stand. So if you're looking at this picture on the left and you see the metal spike, that's going to have your emitter facing straight up. Most times you're going to want to have it coming out either the left or the right hand side so that it's less likely to get knocked out by people walking through. Next slide. Oh, this is my favorite part. Okay, um, Madeline, if you wouldn't mind, we're going to um, actually share the screen, put me on camera, and I'm gonna show you a variety of the different parts. And um, we'll talk about a little bit of this. There we go. So some of the show and tell here. I wanna go first off, I saw there were a couple of questions on pressure regulation uh, in the Q and A, and I want to hit those real quick. Um, pressure, you can test it by using a pressure gauge that you screw onto your hose bib. You can see what the pressure that you actually have coming out into your yard, and then when you connect the pressure filter regulator, that will reduce the pressure down. You can check it by putting a hose end um, thread. On the end of your pressure, on the end of your drip line, turn it on and then see what the pressure is at that point uh, without putting the emitters in. It's a little more difficult to tell once you have it running. If your emitters are dripping, then you know the pressure is reduced. If your emitters are streaming, then you need to make some adjustments. And I'll come back and answer more of those questions when we get to the end here. So a real quick lesson. This is a connector, got a hole in the end. And what we're gonna do is say, we want to attach these two pieces together. I will use my very fancy, say I have a chew. I'm going to cut it so that I have a smooth end, a straight end, not an angled end. You put these two together and literally you really have to push it back and forth. Once you get it in a quarter of an inch, it's attached. It is not going to come out. If you make a mistake, you have to cut it, throw it away and start again. There are other connectors, this being a T. So you could have a main line coming through and then bring this out to a different part of your garden. And then there are elbows for going around corners. The biggest thing people have, they find that they need to do is you need to add sprinklers. You need to add a hole. So this, as we saw in the picture, has the little hole punch. And if this was your drip line on the ground, if I put my hole punch this way, what I'm going to end up with is this has a connector on the end as a little hole with a barb. You stick that in the hole. Now what I would have is 
A sprinkler that's sticking straight up. Everybody that comes by is gonna trip on it. So the goal is what you wanna do is, is just think about it, where you want your emitter. This one I put in the side. And then I can put any variety of emitters into that. You can either put them directly into the tube and water the plant right there. Or if you have plants that are up to three feet away from your main tube, you can use what's called spaghetti tubing. One package of this will last you a lifetime. Um, it's quarter inch tubing. It connects into your drip, into the little connector that you put into it. There are different types. This particular connector has a barbed end on either side. One end is going into your water supply. So you put it into your tube. Ah, this is where you actually would prefer to use a little plier. And the other end, you would put your spaghetti tube into that. So now you have water going from your main tube through the spaghetti tube out to your plant. You cut it off to where you want it to be. And then you can connect an emitter out at the plant. There are a variety of emitters. There are flag emitters. You can see the little flag. I like the flag emitters because you can take the top of it off. If the end gets clogged, you can take the top off. Now water's squirting out, put your finger over it. It puts a strong stream of water out and it'll blow out the debris without having to replace this. Then you put this back on and close it back down again. You do have to do it while the water's on. So you're gonna get wet. That's the only drawback on this. These are called flag emitters. They come in half a gallon, one gallon and two gallons. Then there are little emitters called button emitters. These are button emitters. What I'd like to show you is that they come in different colors. They come in blue, they come in red, and they come in black. The black is a half a gallon and the black is always the least amount of water per hour, half a gallon. Blue is usually the middle stream, so that's one gallon an hour. And the red is always the highest amount of water per hour. This one is two gallons an hour. The, the, standard, um, the standard installation is to use one gallon per hour emitters and to put two on each plant. I'm trying to think of what other things haven't I showed you. And a couple of these other emitters, these are called, I call them bug emitters, but they're teeny, teeny, tiny. And honestly, I don't advise these because they get blocked up and you constantly have to just remove them and replace them. If you happen to have micro spray, these are the little guys that sit up and they spray water out. This is not logistically a drip emitter because this can spray up to 50 to 70 gallons per hour versus drip emitters that may be up to five gallons per hour. But the main thing, a lot of people have these because they, they cover a wide swash of ground. So ground covers work really well with it, but they're really, these little tips, the, notice this one is blue. It goes black, blue, red, as for the lowest amount of water, the medium water and the highest amount per hour, but they're really hard to get off. This tool has a little tool for micro sprinklers. It fits on that and you can unscrew it without hurting your fingertips. These break and so you'll need to replace them regularly. The key is make sure you always turn your irrigation on at least once a month during the day. Look at it, see if you see geysers, which means that there's an emitter that fell out. And if an emitter fell out, my very favorite goof plug. A goof plug is what you use in your pipe, in your mainline pipe, when you make a mistake, like, oh, I don't want that one going straight up and down. Now I have a hole in my pipe. The goof plug fills it in. So you take it, yeah, pop it in. You no longer have water leaking out of there. If your plant died, you can take it out and cover that water hole. You always wanna keep those around. Um, 
hard to see what you guys are looking at, but I think let's move on to the next slides. And, um, and then I can address specific questions when we get to the end on all of these. Because most of the, most of the repairs that people will be making, uh, they'll be lost emitters, chewed on emitters. Dogs love to chew on these. They will be cut pipes, which you'll use a connector to fix. They'll be streaming that you need to have a better pressure regulator. And Madeline, if you can bring the presentation back up, that'd be great. And all of these are things that everybody can actually do on their own. Ah, there we go. So these are some, some visuals on different emitter types that we have. On the left, you're looking at the button emitters or the flag emitters. Those are individual emitters for each plant. If you have a soaker hose, not really a drip, it's going to give water all along the hose itself. Those run beyond 30 gallons an hour, even when you have your hose only cracked open maybe a quarter of the way. On the very right side, you're going to see the micro sprays. Very common for areas that, uh, for ground covers and such. But you can see on this picture, most of that water is going on to bark. And unless you like to weed, I don't really find that I want to water bare patches of dirt or just bark. Next slide, please. So I've already talked about the micro irrigation about this. They do work well. I mean, Ed, there are sprinkler setups that are individual for each different type of landscape. When we're talking about ground covers and low water using plants, micro sprays can be just the perfect thing you're looking for. Uh, but for today, these are not considered drip and then we'll, we'll talk about them at a later time. So um, next slide, please. Little short version of the emitters that I tried to show you on the computer screen, flag emitters. They come in one and two gallon. Um, they have a little spiral path, same as the ones below at the button emitters. Those are called tortuous path. Uh, they, that's how the water gets slowed down. The pressure is reduced by the friction of the water going through that little like cog pattern within it so that uh, you put it at 25 PSI. By the time it comes out, it's much less than that. You're getting just a drip. Next slide. These are adjustable emitters. And you don't really want to put those as every single emitter on your drip line, but they work really well if, say, you have an established landscape and you're putting some new plants in that need a little extra water. You can adjust these. You can open them and you'll get more water flow Instead of two gallons in an hour, you can get up to seven gallons in an hour. And then as the plant becomes established, you can turn them down. I've also seen people use these when they have, say, an accent plant uh, that needs a lot more water than the rest of the succulents or something that they have. And that way, they can increase the water just to that plant and not overwater all the rest of the landscape. Um, but in general, they use a lot of water, so be cautious when you're putting them in your landscape and remember to turn it down once the plants are established. Next, next slide, please. So <laughs> this is one of my favorite pictures. You can see that the emitters, uh, the spaghetti tubing is putting out the top of the tube. If you were to walk through there, you're going to send your dog walking through it. Um, they would trip on it, and I can promise you, you would see 15-foot geysers coming out but it's a great slide to show you uh, the spaghetti tubing to the emitter, to the plant. Next slide. There are different ways to attach emitters to the tubing itself. You can, starting on the left, you can put the emitter directly in the main supply water line and then bring the spaghetti tube out. I would recommend against that. It leaves the open part of the spaghetti tube for ants to crawl into and slugs to crawl into and block it up. The next thing you see is the goof plug. Everybody should have goof plugs. Those are your best friend. It never fails. Somewhere a plant doesn't make it. 
and you need to plug a hole. Or if it's me, I put the hole on the wrong side and then I need to plug it and then put a new hole in so I can attach my emitter. The, the one in the middle is the spaghetti tubing out to the emitter and that's a button emitter, but that works really well. Then you don't have to put a whole lot of those big black tubes. You can stretch them out and then reach out with spaghetti tubes to your plants. You can put the emitter directly in the tube. You can make a little inline drip ring around your plant. I usually use that. I'll use an inline tubing around a tree. So I, this is just a visual of what it would look like. It uses a T connector. You make a big ring around it and then you have multiple water sources all around the drip line of the tree. And then my favorite way in a regular landscape um, is only to put one hole in the main line and then to attach a T with two separate little emitters on either side of the plant. Always, always when you get to the end of your tube, use a figure eight closure or a zip tie. Don't use duct tape. It won't hold the end of your tube closed. And in time, that's gonna open. And then when your sprinkler comes on for the 20 minutes or the 30 minutes that it's running, you're gonna have an open hose and a really large water bill at the end of the month. Next slide, please. So these are some of the common issues that I see on a regular way is when you put your irrigation on, on that left-hand one, you can see that's a cut pipe. Somebody hit it with a, with a, a shovel, but when the water's not flowing, all you see is just a, a divot in the ground. So look for a divot, turn the sprinkler on, see if you see this, that's an easy fix. You can use a connector to fix it. The middle bottom tube, you see that little spray coming out of the drip tube, that's where um, an emitter came out. It popped out too high a pressure, somebody stepped on it. You can fix it with a goof plug or you can just replace the emitter and the spaghetti tube. Uh, the cut pipe, that's an obvious one. You don't see it too well, but I do see uh, when people will hook a hose or they'll do the threaded parts of their drip tubes and they didn't use Teflon tape, the plumbing tape, you'll get a little stream of water that's not obvious, but it's, you know, look at it here, it's watering a very lovely dirt patch. Next page. Question comes out often, you know, how many emitters do I need? How close can I put them? The emitter decision really has a lot to do with what kind of plant you have and what kind of soil you have. The general rule is two emitters per plant, one on either side, the bigger the plant, the wider the emitters are going to be. You want it under the drip zone of the plant. And just remember that majority of the feeder roots and the majority of the, the plant roots are in the top six to eight inches of the soil and they spread horizontally. So you want to move those emitters as the plants mature. Next slide, please. This is just a visual and it shows in one foot increments, the smallest of plants have most of its feeder roots in the very surface. Even a, a hedge size plant, something that's two feet or less, still has almost all of its feeder roots within the top eight to 10 inches. And trees themselves will have a wider expanse of roots. So you wanna make sure that as the plants grow, you're moving your emitters out underneath the drip tubing of that plant. Next line, please. Not very great pictures, uh, but uh, from my front yard, it shows the T showing water uh, going directly to a plant off the main tube and then inline drip tubing under a citrus tree uh, that is actually out under the canopy of the tree itself. And it should be covered by mulch, but I haven't gotten any new mulch this winter. Not yet, it's a good time though. Inline drip tubing works really, really well for underground for lawn alternatives. You can see that there are very small little plants here. Go to the next slide. And six months later, that lawn retrofit, this is Carapia. It is not a grass. It's a low water using lawn alternative. It's being watered with inline tubing subsurface. And this is only six months later. So you can see the advantage to that. There's no overspray, there's no runoff. Next slide. 
if you're looking to do some design at your own home, I mean, the first thing to think about is, are you going to hook it up to your hose or do you have a current valve? And then you want to look at your area that you want to water. The biggest thing that you want to take into consideration when you're designing is, do you have a hillside? Old school was you'd run that, that hose up and down the hill. Well, every time you turned it off, all the water would drain out to the low head, which was the bottom of the hill. So lessons learned over the years, you wanna put the water vertically across the hill or horizontally, excuse me, across the hill so that it's in steps. You have some at the top, some in the middle, some at the bottom. When the water gets turned off, you get an even discharge of the water that's in the pipes and a much more efficient way of applying the water. Next slide. This is a lot of words on this page, but basically what it's saying is that you get about 200 feet of drip tubing. People ask me, can I run it through the front yard all the way to the back? Probably not. You get 200 feet from your water source. So if you plug it in at one, you get your water coming in at one end of the tube, you could go 200 feet to the end. But there is a trick. If you can take your water supply and put it in the middle of the tube, you can get 200 feet to the left and 200 feet to the right. So you actually can get 400 feet of drip tubing. It's not advised to bury it. Uh, there's little water supplies, roots will grow up into your tube and you will have little critters that will chew on your pipes. Next slide. I, I already talked about this, sorry, I got ahead of myself, but you wanna make sure that you put your tubes horizontally and they do make what they call check valves that go in on on the low part of your pipe so that when the drip system stops, it holds the water in the tubes instead of having all the water drain out and have to be refilled every time you turn it back on. Okay, next slide. Two emitters per plant, meaning basically if you're using a one gallon and a one gallon emitter, that plant's gonna get two gallons in one hour of watering. So use um, some resources that you might find on, the, on our website. We have a watering calculator that you can put in the type of plant that you have and that you have a drip system with a one or a two gallon emitters. And it'll tell you how many minutes per week advised to water for those kind of plants. And then you can customize it according to what your plant is. You wanna make sure you kind of plan for the future. If this is a brand new, new drip irrigation and your emitters are really close, make sure you go out every year, start in the spring, flush your system out, and then move your emitters out under the drip lines. And it's always important to remember if you have oak trees or some of the different native plants, you may need to irrigate them just to get them established, but then take them off the irrigation. Uh, you can really give yourself a lot of diseases and problems with the, with the plants, especially especially oaks, they have a tendency to get a fungus that kills them uh, if, if their trunks are wet. Next slide, please. We're gonna be having a lunch and learn for pop-up sprinklers. Um, and that's just coming up next week, another quick lunch and learn. Um, no digging involved. We'll try and cover how to do some efficiency retrofits that you can easily do yourself and easy ways to make some repairs and what to look for to make it more efficient. I would really like uh, to invite you to give us some topics, maybe more specifics. What kind of topics would interest you? And we're gonna put it out in a poll here. And then if what you want isn't there, type that into our chat feature so that we can hopefully address something in the future. I'm gonna take a look at some of the questions uh, that have come through the question and answers right now while you're giving me future topics. I'd like to have enough time to be able to answer some of these. All right, so um, did we get, Madeline, are we gonna share? Oh, 
there it is. Irrigation scheduling, yes. That is one of my favorite topics and definitely one that everyone should be comfortable. I can't wait to look, that'll be great. All right, so I'm gonna go through some of these questions real quick. Um, Jim, you asked whether pressure regulators, do we advise you know, controllable pressure regulators or preset? For drip irrigation and for any type of irrigation, a preset regulation is, is your best bet. If it's for your house, then you can put one that's adjustable, but you're spending extra money for it that you probably don't need to. And we've already, um, we've discussed how to check pressure. You use a pressure, a cheap pressure gauge that you can screw on, onto your hose bib to find out what the pressure is and then screw it onto the end of your drip line. And that'll tell you what the pressure is in your drip line itself. And I think this is probably a question that most people have seen and have themselves. You have raised garden beds, uh, vegetable beds, herb beds, and kind of wondering what is the appropriate irrigation type for those boxes? If you're planting row crops, so if it's just a four foot, four by eight foot bed, you can either put in the solid drip and put an emitter to each plant, or you can put in the 12 inch center inline drip emitter. The thing to remember is, is that vegetable gardens, you're gonna have things growing at different maturity levels. So you may have brand new little babies that don't need as much water as your fully mature three month old tomato plant. So as a supplemental water supply, doing the inline drip emitters every 12 inches works really well. And then you have to go out using your, your hose and pressure and um, actually hand water the new babies maybe more frequently when they only need just a little tiny bit. I hope that answers it. It's very individual here. Um, what brand is the green tool for punching holes? I don't know. Oh, hang on, here it is. It's called a pocket punch and it's made by ECM, but basically these little hole punchers and the blue handled hole punchers, you can, they both work. You can purchase them at any of the box stores or you can visit the irrigation supply stores that are here in Santa Barbara. They carry them and definitely a worthwhile investment. Let's see, I think I have a few more. Um, Do you want me to read the questions to you so I can? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, I can't get them to go beyond, I can't get them to move, so. Then the next question we have is about the watering calculator. Does mm -hmm. the watering calculator provide information by season so she can adjust accordingly? Yes, it does. And we have a seasonal adjust feature on the website as well. The watering calculator will give you a good general idea of how many minutes per week based on the month of the year. So if you were to look, it might say water 48 minutes in August, and then it'll say water 12 minutes in December. But the, if you already know your schedule, you can go right to the homepage and the, you will see what's called the, the seasonal adjust or the water budget. And that'll be a percentage that you can just change that seasonal adjust button on your controller to. Like right now we're at 28% of your 100% summertime water use. So um, it's a super easy way. It's a great question because adjusting it seasonally is healthier for the plants and definitely healthier for your wallet. And I'll put a link to the watering calculator and the percent adjust in the, in the chat feature. Oh, thank you. And we've got a question about a hedge, hedge type. Do you have a recommendation for a type of hedge that needs the least amount of trimming? Good question. That's a good question. You're right. Um, one of the things to look at, I, I, I have a few different hedges that I've seen in my mind, and I know most of them they do require some trimming, but what you can do is you can search different plants and read what their maturity size is supposed to be, how wide, 
and how high so you can pick the correct one. Madeline, can you put the link to the um, the Santa Barbara Waterwise Gardens on there as well? The one, one of the other resources on the Waterwise SB uh, website is what's called Waterwise Gardens of Santa Barbara County. And you can do a specific search. You wanna search for hedges, look up hedges, and then under the culture tab, it'll tell you how big it wants to be and how, it, is it a high pruning? Is it a high water use? I think, you know, just off the top of my head as how some, you can look at Raphaelepsis. That's kind of a native plant also known as Indian Hawthorn. Uh, it doesn't grow much taller than about five feet. So, but there could be different species that do grow a little bit taller, but I would advise you to look on, on the, the database on the different plants and actually look at the pictures, see what you like, what would fit into your landscape and then see um, how tall it wants to be. And there are some recommendations in the chat, such as uh, Prunus Caro, oof, these Latin names are always tricky, Carolinia, Caroliniana, bright and tight. Thank you, Katie, for that recommendation. Oh, yeah, that one is nice. Thank you, that's great. All right, we've got a question about uh, giant bird of paradise trees, beautiful trees. How much water do you think uh, should be applied in terms of gallons per hour if you're watering a giant bird of paradise on a drip? Considering that a, a giant bird of paradise, by the time it's a giant, um, it's pretty mature and they're really low water using. So you would need to probably only supplementally water a bird of paradise in the summertime and especially right in the beginning of the spring when it's starting to put out its flowers. I would venture to say on something like that, you probably would want to water it like once a week, but you probably would give it anywhere between 45 minutes and an hour with um, multiple emitters around the whole spread of what would be the drip line. But it doesn't need any water any more frequent than once a week. All right, and there's a question about how you flush a drip line. You're talking about in the spring and every month to sort of go through and check things. So how do you flush a drip line? That's a good question. I totally forgot to cover that. You find the end of your drip line where the figure eight closure is. You take the figure eight closure off. If you might have multiple ones. So if you have two ends to your drip line because it went two different directions, open both of those and then turn your sprinklers on for two to three minutes. There's gonna be enough pressure running through the drip line that's not gonna come out the emitters. It's actually gonna wash out any sediment and water sludge that's been sitting down in there over the winter time. Then turn it off, put the ends back on, put the figure eight ends back on and you should be good to go. Then put the sprinklers on and make sure you don't have any um, spaghetti tubing or emitters that have been knocked off over the winter season. All right, um, there's also a great bit of information um, that was pro provided by Jean that drip irrigation was developed and patented here in Santa Barbara. It was Resin Industries on East Gutierrez in the mid 1940s and her dad was the co-founder. So that's exciting. Good old wow. Santa Barbara. Um, there's a question about hedges, Catalina cherries. Could you comment on if those are good for hedges? I do not know off the top of my head uh, Catalina cherry. I'd have to look it up. There's some really good resources. Um, San Marcos growers, you can pull, you know, pull them up and then put in the species. Uh, you can pull up under, you can just type it in and, but I would type it into a Google search and then go to like native California plants. Don't go to a, a seller. Don't go to a retailer for the information but the USDA and the university systems usually have some really good information about specific plants. And you, know, you can always reach out as well to the master gardeners of Santa Barbara, that's through the Botanic Garden and um, to actually go on the website for the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden as well, because they are a great resource. And then this is a great question in terms of the um, rainstorm that we just had. And when we do have rainstorms, 
How long do you recommend keeping a drip system off following a rainstorm? We did have a, a pretty decent one. I think it was over two inches. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what guidelines do you have for that, Kathy? My guidelines are usually turn it off. <laughs> Once we, especially drip plants, unless it's a brand new garden that you're still establishing the root structure, if it's been in for over a year and a year and a half, it's made it through a summer already, you're actually better off using rainwater to be your main supply and only supplementally watering, say we don't get any rain in a month. Go out and give it a, a good drink of water, a half an hour, 40 minutes of a drip line, just to moisten up the top surface. Make sure you're covering it with mulch so that the mulch will hold the moisture in and will start to break down as the spring comes in and release some nutrients for the plants because that's what they're looking for. If you water on a regular schedule every Monday and Thursday or something like that, even in the winter time, you're not stressing the plant and causing it to actually seek out new water supplies. And the only way a plant is gonna spend out new roots is if it has the opportunity to dry a little bit. If you let it dry a little bit in between, get some oxygen in there, the roots will grow out. You will have basically a bigger gas tank, a bigger area that the plant can draw moisture and nutrients from and you make it much, much more drought tolerant. So winter time, do your best to not water every single, you know, don't water the same as you did in the summer you know, a couple times a month. If you have water-wise plants, if you have some plants that are small little flowers, you may actually have to water just a little bit, about a third of the amount of water you gave it in the summer. Kind of vague answer, but every landscape is, is very different. All right, thank you, Kathy. There's a question about the slopes. So for slopes, when you're using multiple horizontal tubing, how do you connect the tubing? You run one, so if you pretend you're looking at a piece of graph paper, you've got one pipe that runs straight down the hill, top to bottom. And then at the top of the hill, you put a T in that pipe and you run a drip tube across the hill. And then you go down maybe another eight feet, you run a drip tube using a T. So you've gone into your main supply, run it across, and then do that all the way going down the hill. You then make sure on each of those um, cross pieces, the horizontal ones that you put a hose end spray, a hose end closure, so that when you look at it, you're gonna see like the letter E, you'll see one main supply and then going across the hillside. Hopefully that makes sense. Do you have a um, low water use plant that you recommend for pollinators? Ooh, I, I do, my bees love, um, to be honest, they love rosemary. They love lavender. Um, if you have a tree, one of the trees, if you're going to put even a small, if you're going to put a small hedge that you want to see some pops of color and, and be a good pollinator, it's a citrinus um, called Little John uh, Bottle Brush. There we go. Little John Bottle Brush is about three feet high and has these little puffy bottle looking things and they absolutely love that. Uh, so most everything we plant, even jade plants here, the succulent jade plant, if you let it go to flower, the, the bees love it. Butterflies, they have their specific things that they feed on. Uh, Lantana will actually feed the monarch butterflies, but they lay their eggs on the milkweed so if you have milkweed butterfly bush, make sure you plant some lantana so that they can grab a little nectar at the same time as they're laying eggs on your butterfly bush. We've got a question about check valves. So on the hillside system that you just described, where would the check valves go? The check valves would go at the top of the hillside before it goes uh, at, at the top of the hillside as it goes down the main line supply before it goes out to the little lateral lines. That would stop the water from going down any further. And you could put one at every one of the lateral lines. 
And we have a question about the recording. We're going to post it on YouTube on our web page and we're going to email it to everyone who registered. So it will be widely available. Um, we've got a question about Santa Inez Valley versus Santa Barbara. And um, how is that accounted for in something like the watering percent adjust? I recommend people who live um, out of the Santa Barbara Valley area who live up North County to go to the WaterWise SB, which is the county website. They actually look at the weather stations. They take weather stations from Santa, Santa Maria, um, Buellton, Guadalupe, and the North County web weather stations and give you a percentage based on that. But basically the percentage ends up being almost exactly the same. They may be in the summer a little hotter. And so if you know how much, say in San Inez for the same plant in Santa Barbara, you need to water it 30 minutes and I only need to water it 22 minutes. That's my 100% watering. If I'm going to adjust it by 33% and I live in San Inez, my 33% is going to be based on more water. So you're still going to be giving it more water because your weather is different. San Inez gets some freezes as well. So you have the opportunity to really turn your irrigation off. If the soil is less than 55 degrees, most plants are going dormant. So if you're getting some freezes, you can just turn your irrigation off until the soil warms up a little bit before you need to start irrigating. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, like I said, we'll post this on our garden classes webpage. Uh, we are having our sprinkler lunch and learn next week, next Thursday, the 21st at noon. So if you would like to join us then, we would love to see you as well. And the recording will be emailed out to all attendees. So thank you all for joining us. It's been a pleasure and um, hope to see you next week. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.